Hello, YouTube. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's been a minute since I've done uh, one of these office hours. And uh, so I wanted to do one today. So hi, everybody. Uh, I do not have an agenda, really, or uh, even a topic. I'll, I'll play a little bit, and I hope some folks will join uh, and ask questions. That, that's why I'm here, to, uh, to dive into whatever is on your mind. Um, I do, I do want to mention that uh, I, I put a, a link here in the chat. I pinned it. And uh, that is for a fundraiser that I'm currently uh, doing to, to fund a new jazz trio record that, that I'm going to record in August with Larry Grenadier on bass and Joey Barron on drums. So uh, if you want to support that record, you can follow the GoFundMe link. That is, um, that is pinned in the chat. And I'll probably mention that again uh, a little later. So, hi, Jill, how's it going in, in Quebec? Uh, what are you up to? What are you working on? So I can maybe just play a little bit. Jill, uh, talk to me. Tell me, uh, tell me, uh, and I hope I'm saying it right. I, I could be uh, uh, saying it wrong. It looks like Jill to me. What's happening in uh, Quebec? What are, you, what are you playing? What are you working on? What are you thinking about? Uh, don't leave me here alone. Um, I just... Uh, wrapped up last week I was at a teaching at Jazz Camp West in Northern California and it was so great to be able to teach real students in real time I was teaching classes um, at a campsite in a, in a little town called La Honda well not in the town but in the woods and it was so nice uh, to be able to gather with people there was of course, there was a COVID protocol to keep everyone safe. And, and all of my classes were outdoors uh, on the forest floor, just under under the trees. No, no walls, no uh, nothing indoorsy about it at all. So it was really nice to be able to take questions uh, from students and play a little bit. Two people watching from uh, Quebec. What are, what are the odds of that? That's cool. Hey, Glenn, Michael. What? Why? <laughs> what is? What are the odds of uh, of everybody <laughs> tuning in from uh, from Montreal? Uh, well, from Quebec. Wow. Yeah. Uh, this this jazz camp was really incredible. You want to check it out uh, it's called jazz camp west it happens every summer uh the website is living jazz 
livingjazz.org. It's not just for guitar players, of course. Um, there's piano players and drummers and bassists and trombonists and vocalists and dancers. It's a uh, and oh and percussion, Latin percussion. It's it's interdisciplinary. And and the really fun part is a, a lot of the students are, are are doing multiple things. Maybe guitar is their main thing, but then they show up and they take a Latin percussion class or a dance class and not just take the class, but then at the end of the week they they do a performance with their class. So that really makes it real. Um, you can't just sit in the corner and practice but you actually have to get up and uh, do a little performance at the end of the week it's really nice hi Aram, not from canada yeah <laughs> well you're you're the exception that proves the proves the rule Glenn Michael Thompson says, I'm waiting for a call from Sean Phillips, maybe helping him on his tour in Quebec. Uh, actually, I don't know Sean Phillips. Is, is he a performing artist? And, 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 and how are you going to help him? Are you helping promote the shows or helping him find a place to stay? I'm curious. Uh, Bobby's coming in with a question. Gilles has a question about uh, triad superimposing. Uh, comping in a, yeah, I see. Um, upper structure triads and triad pairs. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to try to answer. Uh, uh, I'll just try to answer in the order that these uh, things come in. Gilles says um, tri superimposing triads. So it could mean uh, uh, when you're improvising, like let's say your your chord is A7, right? You might think, well, I'll, maybe I'll play an A triad because that's the fundamental part of an A7 chord, so you're going to improvise. But um, it's it's correct, but it's, it's not particularly uh, interesting or colorful. So we might think about superimposing other triads over A7. So um, one place to start with that is think about what scale we're playing, and then we can look into what are the triads that we can make within that scale. So if you're thinking about, excuse me, A7 as a mixolydian sound, that's one kind of scale that relates to A7. Then we could say, well, what are the triads in A mixolydian? And maybe we could try superimposing those. So what we get is A, B minor, C sharp diminished, D, E minor, 
minor, F sharp, G, and A. So I could try superimposing any of those. diminished F sharp minor G so I'm kind of just jumping around A C sharp diminished E minor G B minor D F sharp minor A and I'll do them uh, in order A G F sharp minor E minor D C sharp diminished B minor A. And we could do uh, what people call triad pairs, where we just pick two of those and then run them through different inversions. So we could do A and G. If you can see what I'm doing. So that's A, G, A, G, A, G. So I'll, I'll try to make some melody out of that. Like you don't have to play all three notes in the triad. What I'm doing here is I'm thinking about these shapes and just playing the notes on the second and third string. Or just the notes on the first and second string. Or just the notes on the first and third string. Or mix it up. Possibilities. That's all just from A mixolydian. But then what if we wanted to use, um... oh, and you might wonder, well, why did I pick A and G as a triad pair? You could really pick any two triads and, and get some nice sounds. I always recommend picking two adjacent triads like G and A or B minor, uh, sorry, B minor, C sharp diminished or D, E minor. Because if you pick two triads that are next to each other in, in whatever scale, uh, two triads next to each other have no notes in common. Whereas if you just pick two random triads from the scale, you might wind up with uh, the two triads might have one or two notes in common. And that's not bad, but it's just less bang for your buck. So that's why I picked G and A, but I could have just as easily picked B minor, C sharp diminished. That's kind of a, a neat option because neither of those triads has the A in it. So when somebody's playing an A7, you can totally avoid A in your lines. And that's kind of cool. And it doesn't have, just have to be on these high three strings, but I'm doing that just to keep it uh, clear. So, um, of course, you could pick another scale. You could think about uh, if, if you wanted to have like an A7 flat nine, quality. You could maybe um, think of, uh, well, if you want to go really deep, you could pick the like A13 flat nine sound, which comes out of this um, eight note symmetrical scale. Lot of triads you could superimpose there. So I'm playing A, F sharp, C major, E flat. Those are all triads that you can make from that scale. So that, that's that's a lot of tension and color if, if you want it. Also, we can superimpose triads in chord voicings. So 
like A7, if the chord is A7 flat 9, you could put one of those triads just in the upper part of your chord. So that's A7 flat 9. This is an F sharp triad. We could do it with an E, e flat triad. You could do it with a C triad, in which case you'd, you'd want to have a C sharp below the C major triad to help people hear that it's an A7 chord and not just an A minor 7 chord. So putting the C sharp in there. So, so you can also, uh, I think when people say superimposition, superimposing a chord, uh, they're, they're generally thinking about lines, but uh, what I was showing you is, uh, has more to do with chord voicings or um, like that. So, okay. So that's a lot about that. I hope, Jill, that that was helpful. And now I'm going to go to Bobby Quigley, who, who barged in, uh, wondering what's your approach to comping in a jazz trio, like an organ trio or a classic trio with bass from London. Okay, Bobby, I hope you're still there. Uh, I'm going to try to answer this. Um, when I'm comping in an organ trio, uh, organ trio is slightly different from uh, guitar, bass, and drums. So or, when I say organ trio, and I think that's what you're talking about here, you're talking about guitar, organ, and drums, and also uh, another possibility could be guitar, bass, and drums. So in guitar, organ, and drums, I tend to to leave off the bass note because the organ player is already playing it. Or if I do, so let's say I'm, I'm playing this turnaround. B minor 7, E7, A minor 7, D7, G. So let's say I'm doing two beats each. And then a bar of that. So I don't really need to play the B because um, the organ player is probably playing the roots of all of these. So I might just play. So I'm just playing shell chords, really, you could say. So that's seven and three on the B, three and seven on the E, and then seven, three, three, seven, seven, three. Now, if you don't know these as shapes on their own, you could play what you know and just not play the bottom note. So you could do that. Uh, like, sorry, you could actually grab the grips that you know, but just not catch the bass note with your thumb. Or just catch it very lightly, like, you know, kind of feather the thumb and really um, try to bring out the upper note. So, so that's the main idea. And then you could even add uh, some notes on, on, on the B string. You could maybe do this. Or try to make it a little more. You know, a little more active like that. But you want to, as soon as you start adding, you know, nines or flat nines or sharp nines, then you want to be really listening to the organ player, you know, how how much of that stuff are they doing? If, if they're doing a lot of alterations in the chords, then this stuff in the middle is safe. So, so you might want to practice that, you know, like uh, take a, you know, take some turnarounds and do, do that in some different keys. Maybe also learn a, a standard where you can do the whole thing just on the middle two strings, like um, all the things you are, So I'm playing F minor 7, B flat minor 7, E flat 7, A flat major 7, D flat major 7, G7, C major 7. And, and really get to know those middle two strings and just playing thirds and sevenths. Um, also, well, that's just talking about harmony, but you also want to think about rhythm because if you're just playing... Uh, whole notes on, on the start of every bar, that, that gets a bit taxing on, on everybody's ears. The organ player is not going to like it. The audience isn't going to like it. You're probably not going to like it. So 
then what are you, what are you supposed to do rhythmically? <laughs> well, um, you could think in some kind of phrase like ba, oh, one, two, three, four, ba, ba, da, ba, 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 da, 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 ba, da, da, ba, ba, da, da. So that would be this. wasn't that grooving as I played it because it, it just wasn't focused. One more time. Two. Oh, two, three. Oh. So something like that is repetitive and it'll be easy for, for the drummer and the organ player to pick up on what you're doing because it's sort of a pattern. Um, you could just listen to some jazz records and, and try to learn some patterns that you see come up all the time. Uh, that's if, you know, there's lots of stuff that you see on YouTube where it's just like the three levels of this or the five levels of that. So level one would just be whole notes. And then level two would be a simple pattern, uh, maybe a two bar pattern like what I did. And then... Or maybe level two would be just a one bar pattern like ba 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 so that'd be ba 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 and then level three would be a two bar pattern and then level four would be um Maybe a four bar pattern. You know, so, something that were you really thinking about a four bar phrase? And then level five would be just not using any patterns at all, um, just listening to what's happening and, and either reacting to what's happening or if things feel like they need a little, you know, nudge because they're a little bit uh, uh, dull, you could instigate something, you know. So sometimes when we're comp, we want to be reactive to what the soloist is doing or if somebody's playing the melody, we want to kind of uh, be complementary to, to what's happening. That's what comping is. It's complementing, uh, not complicating, but complementing. And, or, or also I think of comp as a company. So it could be part of a company or a compliment, but sometimes it's our job to instigate stuff. So tr try to be sensitive to that. Does the music need a little trouble or is there already enough trouble and, and you're just trying to hold it down? So um, the only thing I would say that I would do differently between an organ trio and if there was a, a bassist instead of an organist is um, you also, if you're comping in, a, in that setting, then that, that means the bass player is soloing. So that's, that's when you want to maybe play higher up voicings even than that. So maybe for all the things you are, I might work on stuff up here. I'm, I'm still doing a lot of thirds and sevenths on these middle two strings, but I'm also adding stuff up here. So I went to this F minor seven, put a nine on top, and then maybe this uh, B flat minor nine, so the root is here, E flat seven, uh, now I've flatted the 13, this is with a 13, flat 13, this is an A flat six nine, E flat major nine uh, G7, just plain old boring G7, but you can put the flat nine if you want. C major seven with the nine on top. So these kind of higher up voicings are good when the bassist is soloing because you want to get out of their way. Um, some bass players like it when you don't comp during their solo. Uh, 
so they have more freedom to to play with the harmony they don't want to be boxed in uh i've also had bass players tell me you know please comp when i'm soloing because they feel like there's a tendency for guitar players to just drop out when there's a bass solo and uh, they don't want that so try to get to know the people that you're playing with and maybe ask them not not before the gig i think i would ask on a set break or maybe not even ask but just try different ways and see how they react if they're smiling keep doing it if they're not smiling or if they're worse than not smiling if they're shooting you some side eye then try to figure out what you're doing that's not supportive and uh, see if you can intuit what might be supportive or you could just ask them so uh, that's what i do uh dunlop uh let's see so i i want to continue uh with alex's question even though i really like um uh, Mackenzie choice question about thoughts on three note per string scale pattern. But since we're already talking about comping, let's stay there. Um, okay. How about comping in a more duo situation? How can one develop more rhythmic variation? I feel like I've been playing only using the same Charleston style <laughs> comping ideas for years. So if, if people don't know what Charleston is, it's dotted quarter eighth on beat one and the and of two. So all the things you are, if we're still there, it could be. That's Charleston style. Which would get tiring pretty fast. Um, I mean, one thing is just, you know, some new patterns. So you could play da ba ba da ba 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 da ba 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 da. That'd be like this: one, two, three, four. Ba ba da ba 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 da ba two three ba da ba 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 da. So, like, I don't know of a book of patterns, but <clears throat> excuse me, listen to some records and try to see, or to try to just grab a pattern that you hear somebody do. Listen to the Oscar Peterson trio and listen to Oscar Peterson comping behind uh, Ray Brown's bass solo. Or, um, you know, listen to, If you can find, there's there's uh, Jim Hall recorded a duet record with Ron Carter. It's called Alone Together. That's a great resource uh, for ideas for comping. Uh, Jim Hall has a duo record with Bill Evans, the pianist. The great, there's going to be some great ideas there for comping. Uh, Jim Hall also recorded a, a duo record with Red Mitchell, if you can find that. Or Jim Hall's trio record, it's just called Live. It's uh, with Don Thompson and Terry Clark, uh, recorded, I think, uh, somewhere in Toronto, I think. And so, you know, you don't have to transcribe a whole comping uh, passage, but listen, listen to a little bit and, and see what's going on. Is it pattern based? Is it, is it, is it? You know, the Charleston is just one pattern. There's lots of other patterns. Uh, is it pattern-based or is it more kind of a stream of consciousness? We need to be able to do both. We need to lock into something kind of steady, and we also need to be able to just flow. The pattern thing, listen, listen for patterns in other people's comping, and, and there's, there's stuff that's idiomatic to jazz, so... You know, those are the rhythms you want to focus on rather than like, hey, let's figure out every possible mathematical rhythmic thing we could do. Um, that's fun if you like to study music that way. I, I wouldn't discourage you. But if we're talking about jazz, then, um, you know, learn the idiom, which could mean listening to a Count Basie record or... Um, 
you know, even something that doesn't have guitar on it, but just listen to what the rhythm section is, is doing and, and listen to kind of riff based stuff, um, which you hear in some early Count Basie and some early Duke Ellington and kind of anything from the swing era. It's a little bit more riff based. And so you'll find some other things that, that you can grab onto and then listen to stuff that's really free flow. I mean, not free, but free flowing stream of consciousness, like Jim Hall playing with Sonny Rollins on an album called The Bridge. His, his comping there is incredible. That would be worth transcribing, even if it's just eight bars or four bars. And one more Jim Hall recommendation with the Jimmy Jufri three uh, with Ralph Pena on bass and Jimmy Jufri either on clarinet or saxophone. Uh, Jim Hall comping there is great. You know, there's no drums and he's really taking care of rhythm and and a lot of harmony. So there there are other great compers, but Jim Hall is is the guy that I really uh, love and you can learn a lot from him. So Alex, I hope that was helpful. Um, I want to mention again something that I uh, mentioned at the top of this, which is... Uh, related maybe to this i'm i'm going to be making a guitar trio record uh, with bass and drums in august uh, with larry grenadier on bass and uh, joey baron on drums and i'm going to be doing a fair bit of comping when i'm not soloing so i'll be thinking about all this stuff uh, and i'm using gofundme to to fund the record so if that's something uh, that you feel like you want to support put the GoFundMe link in there and, and you can check it out if you want to. Um, okay, Mackenzie Choi, I don't know if you're still here, Mackenzie, but I'll answer your question anyway. What are your thoughts on three notes per string scale pattern method? Uh, I like it. It really depends on what your goals are. You know, what are your intentions? I would say... Um, and, and for anybody that's not sure what we're talking about, like three note per string, if, if you're playing G major, could be this. That's opposed, as opposed to something more in one box, like uh, the caged version of that. This is more str uh, stretchy and covers a little bit more span from the top note to the bottom. Uh, the caged position would just get us to here. This gets us to here. So it covers a little bit more. Um, I like it. I think it's really useful, especially if you're doing anything... Um, where you're practicing like melodic sequences. Stuff like that. Because then if you go to the next position up, which you could say is A Dorian, the picking would be the same. the a dorian uh for the a dorian pattern from uh, and g ionian and then same with b phrygian uh. so really useful if you're doing any kind of practice where you're you're playing pattern based stuff um so it's really good. That That's what I studied when I was in music school. Uh, the scales were presented that way. And I, I had a lesson uh, around that time while I was in music school. I, I took a lesson with Mike Miller, incredible guitar player, Mike Miller, who you should check out. He's fantastic. And at that time that he encouraged me to play that way and work out all these like those kind of patterns or you know more 
intervallic stuff too. So that's a fifth, third, third, um, uh, third, third. So then. didn't do the I didn't do the shift sorry but just only to show that um, you don't you don't have to play da 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 it doesn't have to be that fundamental you could do uh, more wide interval leaps in in those shapes if you want to even though I didn't follow the right shape with my left hand you, you get the idea um, so I like that I also like the caged system uh, I also like Mick Goodrick's sort of uh, Berkeley style position playing. It really depends on what your particular intentions are in your practice and in performance. So try try that for a while, then maybe try the caged system, then maybe try the Mick Goodrick uh, Berkeley style position playing, which uh, he, Mick Goodrick writes about in The Advancing Guitarist. If you wanna check out, that's a great book. I highly recommend The Advancing Guitarist by Mick Goodrick. Uh, all, all of these systems have advantages and disadvantages. No, no system is perfect just because anytime you're using any one system, you're, you're missing out. You're hopefully finding lots of possibilities there, but perhaps at the expense of some other possibilities. We can't do it all. Just pick one and, and stay there for a while and, and uh, maybe six months or a year and check in with yourself and, and see see if you want to stay there or, or, or move on. I've, I've worked on lots of different approaches over the years and, and you probably will too. Uh, Yeah, Michael Gorman says organ players usually cover a lot of musical territory. Qu quite right. So, um, you know, listen, listen to records of people doing it, and and see see what they do. You know, and maybe even watch YouTube video of of guitar, organ, drums, trio. Um, it's, you know, it's a personal choice of what you want to play, what you hear and what you want to play, but also, you know, what the other people you're playing with would like you to do as well. So there's no one way that works all the time. I've, I've made three organ trio records, uh, two with Larry Goldings and, and one with Red Young. And there's different things that work in, in, you know, complementing the styles of different people. It depends on the tunes. It depends on a lot. But the answer to a whole lot of your musical questions, not, not just here, but questions you might have later on, um, is check out what the great players are doing and and try to learn from that. That's the, the best indication of, of what works or doesn't work is is watch what other people are doing and, and learn what you can. Uh, what else? Uh, any other questions here? Well, Evan Sake says, uh, hey Adam, good to finally catch an office hours live. I'm working on arranging a couple of Jobim tunes with a view to seeing them as well as playing. Any advice on bossa patterns to comp while singing? Wow. So yeah. Um, I'll show you what I know. I'm definitely not uh, a bossa expert by by any means, but I'll, I'll show you the the um, things that uh, like the kind of basic pattern that I use is that. So is what I'm doing right now is just going around the circle of fourths in C. Be 
this would be a good place to start. I'm playing is C major 7, F major 7, B minor 7, which would have a flat 5, but these are shell chords, so there's no 5 to worry about. E minor 7, A minor 7, D minor 7, G7, C major 7. I'm just going... Bum, bum. place to start. You can keep going. Uh, there it is. And sometimes when I do this, I'll keep the bass on the sixth string no matter what. So this would be like D minor seven, G seven, down low, C major 7, C major 7, uh, F, F major 7, but with the 5th in the bass, B minor 7, E minor 7, it's definitely part of the, uh, part of the idiom is to leave that down there sometimes. So, so that so that's your basic pattern and then you can make it a two bar pattern where you anticipate the and of four so anticipate so that's you're getting the anticipation. Again, listen to those records. Um, transcribe just four bars and see what the guitar is doing. Uh, I love Joao Gilberto. Uh, he's my favorite for comping, although he, he can get pretty complex and non-patterny sometimes. So just try to get it in your ears. L listen to it. A lot. Find find a record that you dig and, and really just listen to it every day for a week, two weeks, and and see what you notice. Uh, try to climb inside the music with the band if if you can. Um, yeah. And, you know, of course, uh, check out some some Antonio Carlos Jobim, Tom Jobim records. Um, uh, my brain, um, those, those are the those are the two that come to mind, you know, Jobim and, and Joao Gilberto. Uh, just start there and 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 listen and listen and listen but don't don't jump around to a bunch of different records really just listen to one record and get into the sound of it and then see what you can learn and then again if there's stuff on youtube especially old classic stuff where you can uh, get into the atmosphere uh, of course there's there's people today making bossa nova music but it it's also idiomatic to a time uh, a time and a place so it's it's good to start at there if you can find some good stuff 
uh, on YouTube and just watch and, and, and see what people are doing. What, what's the technique? What's the feeling? Yeah. Yeah, the album that Jobim did with Sinatra uh, is great. Um, Armando Lopez says, as my music theory knowledge advances, I'm really into reharmonizing any books you can recommend or leads to advance my studies on that. Um, Armando, it's, uh, yeah, uh, there's, let's see, a couple of books that I would recommend for re I'm, I'm assuming that you're a guitar player. Um, that seems to be who hangs out here uh, when I do these. Um, there's a book called Mel Bay's Complete Book of uh, Theory, Harmony, and Chord Voicings, or something like that. The author is Brett, B-R-E-T, Wilmot, W-I-L-L-M-O-T-T, -T, Brett Wilmot. Uh, and even though he's the author, the book is called Mel Bay's Complete Guide to whatever, Harmony Theory, Chord Voicings, I think. Uh, and the, the idea of that book is you you learn your drop two voicings on like your high strings. So that'd be like C major seven. This could be C major seven flat five or C major seven sharp five. C minor seven, C minor seven flat five. So you learn those types of voicings in, in their inversions on the high four strings. Or actually, now that I say it, I think it's you learn them on the middle four strings, I think, is the idea in that book. And then once you learn all those, you learn how to superimpose those to get some different colors. So, like, you might play what looks like F sharp minor 7 flat 5 to be the upper part of a D9 or the upper part of a G sharp 7 altered. You know stuff like that, or, or um, F sharp minor seven sharp five could be the upper part of a of a nice D major chord, or a nice G major seven. So it's not exactly about reharmonization, but it will give you that book will give you a, a lot of new ways to use chord shapes that you already know. And what most of them have in common is that you're not playing the root of like, um, if you use this as a G chord, you're playing F sharp, D, E, A. Really nice voicing for a G major nine. I'm not sure that that's exactly an example from the book. I can't say, oh yeah, that's page 37, example 2A. But it's that kind of idea or this chord if you were using that as, as a G sharp 7 altered it doesn't have a G sharp in it so it's it helps kind of refresh your ears F sharp C E A for G sharp that's the 7 uh, the 3rd the flat 13 and the flat 9 so it's, it's kind of that up here. If if that's already plenty of uh, information for you, get that book. Uh, if you're past that and, and you want to try some really advanced stuff, Mick Goodrick wrote a book with Tim Miller called Creative Chord Voicings, I think, something like that. It's it's a collaborative book, uh, Mick Goodrick and Tim Miller, where they show you a gajillion ways to do that sort of thing, but um, with even more kind of modern sounds. And it, the whole book is based on Stella by Starlight. It's many different harmonizations of that using modern shapes, also eliminating the root. So lots of voicings where if the chord is E minor 7 flat 5, you're not going to play an E, but you're going to play three notes, four notes, um, that have more color. So that's a really kind of advanced book. And then maybe sort of in between that, I might recommend uh, Ted Green has a book called uh, 
modern chord progressions, a lot of which is like one, six, two, five, or three, six, two, five. But, uh, I like it cause there's just lots of lots. I mean, thousands of examples, little short four note, uh, four chord sequences. And especially as the book progresses, there's more and more substitution. So it starts with kind of things that you might already know. Things like that. And it gets kind of bolder and more colorful as the book goes on. So obviously you don't have to start on page one. You could leap in wherever, wherever you want to. Um, and then I would just also transcribe things. I've uh, This week I've been working on the uh, transcription of a uh, do you guys know Bobby Broom, really incredible guitar player in Chicago? I've been transcribing his arrangement of Here's That Rainy Day, which has lots of substitutions. Um, Get exactly but it's it's great like transcribe some real music like th this this thing is what most people play is something like that and he plays um if, if the tune is here's that rainy day getting it but any, anyway th this little thing is so neat oh it's that's what it is it's he goes to g major seven yeah so uh check out some real stuff and, tr and transcribe it um that's bobby broom's arrangement I also a couple of weeks ago was working on Joe Negri's arrangement. This is stuff I found on YouTube, so you can actually see what they're playing and and transcribe. But you'll you'll probably get some of it right and some of it wrong. But just do the best you can. Don't don't get too bogged down. Um, just grab what you can and analyze it. And um, yeah, that, that's real music is is the best teacher. Bobby is your teacher, Gregory. Oh my gosh, lucky you, lucky you. Please, uh, please give him uh, my utmost uh, respect. And um, yeah, the, the, yeah, he's incredible, and I and I bet he's a great teacher. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's his intro. Uh, uh. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
<laughs> you get to see him up close and personal. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. All good for you. Uh, yeah, we're, we're almost at an hour. Any other questions? Anyone else have a question that I can dive into? Uh, I'm not sure who's still here. I wonder if YouTube will tell me. No, YouTube doesn't tell me who's still here. Uh, maybe one more question, if you've got one. I'd love to love to answer it. Um, this guitar, nobody asked, but uh, it's it's a Martin Triple uh, O Twenty Eight from a few years ago. It belongs to my uncle, who's uh, one of my first influences on the guitar. He doesn't play a lot of jazz. He's more like a folk folk and blues guitar player. But this is his guitar, which um, is now at my cousin's house, which is where I am now in Oakland, California. Anyway, it's a really nice guitar. When I oh Vitus says, when I play a half tone, whole tone scale in thirds, I only get minor thirds. Is that right? Half whole scale in thirds. I have to think about that. So half whole would be. because that seems like such an obvious thing and I've never thought of it. Yeah, so, so try to find some other things that you could do with it I guess but that's that's a thing you can do so now what I did I started with this which is a sixth and if you do that you get this which is a minor sixth perfect fifth minor six perfect fifth Lots of patterns to explore, but I never thought of that minor third thing. That's pretty cool. Uh, how can I play melody over chord changes in a simple way? How much do you need to see, know the triad within a seventh chord, and what are the benefits of it? Um, so I'll answer. I'll answer those two in reverse order because I think uh, Trayvon's question is a little more straightforward. How much do you need to see or know the triad within a seventh chord and what are the benefits of it? So I think what you're asking is like, okay, this is G major seven. Can you see that there's a B minor? Are, are you wondering like, 
in G major seven, the, seeing the triad of G or seeing the triad of B minor. Because if you're talking about in a seventh chord, seeing the, the triad, then I'm not sure. Well, let me know, because because that might lead to a slightly different thing. So are you asking, say, on G major seven, to be able to see the G or to be able to see that the, this is a B minor? Let me know, because uh, then I can answer that. Um, can I show the chord position for in the morning? Sure. And uh, Leandro, I'm, I'm saving your question for last because it's kind of tricky. So let me, <laughs> it's been an hour and probably everybody's like, what the heck? But I'm going to try to answer, please, no more questions because these are three really good questions and I want to give them uh, enough attention. So everybody else just kind of hang out and maybe you can learn from these questions. So in the morning... So this is a song I wrote for Nora Jones. It's in drop D tuning, capo three, that puts us in F. And I start with this D, but I finger it with two and three. I don't need the high E at all. Uh, and I finger it this way because the second chord goes down. So it's uh, if you started in traditional D, you'd have to change right away. And if you start here, it's just a quicker change. even though I wrote this song. And then A minor seven, B flat six, A minor seven, and back to D. So A minor seven, B flat six, no bar. A minor seven. Okay, so that's in the morning. Um, Trayvon's question. Like, is it important to see the B minor in a G major seven? Um, or what are, what are the benefits to seeing it? Uh, I guess the benefit would be it allows you to play melodically over B minor, uh, over G major seven without playing a lot of G. So normally when, if we're gonna improvise, we might play the arpeggio. And that has a lot of G in it, which is fine. It's not wrong, but it's also a bit redundant. So if you can see the B minorness of it, then that might open your ears up to just play, playing lines that don't have any G. So I might even think of like a B minor seven arpeggio, which sounds really neat over G major seven. Or even like B minor pentatonic. that in the moment of playing this, you need to identify that the B minor is a thing, but just in your broader understanding of music and music theory and fretboard awareness, I think it is nice to know that B minor is the upper part of G major seven. Uh, also, it would just give you more places to play that chord like you can see that that's a that's a B minor 
that's a B minor, so you can put G there or down low. This is a B minor, so you can put G there or down here. Uh, this is B minor, so it just kind of, um, oh, I think it, it's about fretboard awareness and harmonic awareness. Also, could give you if you if you're if you know about uh, neighbor tones and uh, surrounds, I think they're called. You could play. Enclosures, not surrounds, enclosures. Or. It just it helps with visualization. Do you need to know it? No, but I think uh, it will open some pathways to you. So uh, hope, hopefully that's helpful. And then... Leandro asks, how can I play a melody over some chord changes in a simple way? Uh, I guess I need to, I need more context. Uh, are you talking about like jazz chords or more just, uh, could you give me a chord progression that you have in mind? And then I could try to play a simple melody over it. Uh, Leandro, Leandro, if you're still here, tell, tell me some chords that you're thinking about. Trayvon, I, I, I'm glad that that was, I'm glad that that was helpful. Um, Is not answering, so I wonder if Leandro tuned out, um, which is totally understandable. I, I rambled a long time since that question was asked, but uh, you know, and you to me, you've kind of answered the question in your question, like play in a simple way. If you're playing a tune that already has a melody, play that melody. Oh, okay, Trayvon. So yeah, one, six, two, five. So let's let's say we're playing one, six, two, five. So C major, A minor, D minor. I made it D minor seven, G seven. I mean, if you're playing a song that already has a melody, learn that melody and, and play it. It's probably really nice. If it's something that you remembered, it's probably something that's memorable. So don't be afraid to just play. If a tune has a melody, to play that melody. I'm a little bit hesitant to play a specific melody here because that's the kind of stuff that sometimes gets pinged on YouTube as you know, some kind of copyright violation. But um, I'll, I'll play this anyway. This is Heart and Soul. If a tune has a melody, le learn that melody and 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 try to play it. Um, listen to <clears throat> um, uh, so I was just at jazz camp last week, which I mentioned earlier, and I didn't get to take uh, this class. 
I, I was there teaching, but my friend Kate McGarry was also there teaching. And I didn't go to her class because uh, I was just too busy doing my own stuff as a teacher. But she told me about her class that I, I want to describe here if I can, because I think it might help answer that question. So her class was called The Second Time Around. And what it was about was listening to jazz singers like Sarah Vaughn or uh, Ella Fitzgerald or, you know, classic jazz vocalists from, the, from that era, from the 50s, say. And what do they do once they've sung the tune once, and it, you know, oftentimes they'll sing it again before they turn it over to a... a an instrumental soloist and not talking about scat singing where it's like a real, like kind of a bebop improvisational conception, but just what do they do once they've sung the melody kind of straight, like as you would read it off the page in quarter notes and eighth notes and whatever, what do they do the second time that keeps it still interesting to our ears without getting into, you know, full on scat singing, but just singing the tune again. So I don't have a particular record I can recommend right now, but see, see what you can find of Dinah Washington or Ella Fitzgerald or Sarah Vaughn from the 1950s and listen to what they do once they've sung the song. What do they do the, the second time around, the second course of the tune? There, there's a lot we could learn there. Um, and then as far as just improvising something straight up uh, um, and keeping it simple, I mean, it's right in there. Keep it simple. Play the same note. If you've played a note, play it again. Play it again. Play it again. Try to go up. go down. Do you see something a little more zigzaggy? it simple. Make yourself play simple. Repeat things. Uh, use patterns, uh, sequences, so that it just stays real easy for the listener to latch on to what you're doing. Uh, Gregory Commonall. Okay, this is my last question that I'm really going to click off here because this is a big chunk of, of stuff. Um, yeah, books on sight reading, it really depends on your level. Uh, which I don't know what your level is, and I'm sure you do know what your level is. Uh, but the books that I've always turned to have been the the um, William Levitt Berkeley series. There's uh, Guitar Method Volume One, Two, Three. There's a William Levitt book on melodic rhythms for guitar. Um, if that stuff is easy for you, then I might look at Bob Mincer. He's a saxophone player. He's got these blues and funk, and I think it's blues and funk etudes for saxophone. Uh, those are great reading exercises for guitar. Uh, make sure you get the book that's in the key of C, because that book is published for also for B flat and E flat instruments like tenor sax or alto sax. Um, uh, I just practice every day, you know, uh, even if even a book that's not a sight reading book, um, you know, go, go to a yard sale and just buy whatever music books you can find or go to the library and borrow something and just read every day. Um, that makes you a, a better reader. 
but as far as like books that I've actually used, the the William Levitt books are really useful, and the Bob Mincer books are useful. Um, also, try transcribing stuff and actually writing it out. That's the kind of looking at through the other end of the telescope, but learning how to translate a musical idea in your head or from a record onto the page, I also think helps make you a better reader. Um, I can't explain the mechanics of that, but I've found that to be true for myself. Okay. Uh, thanks everybody. Um, I'll mention it one more time. Uh, of course, uh, no, 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 uh, pressure here, but I'm about to make a jazz record in August. Uh, I'm using GoFundMe to help raise some money to cover the cost of recording and mixing and mastering and uh, some travel expenses. Uh, the drummer that I'm playing with, Joey Barron, uh, lives in Berlin, so got to fly him over and, of course, pay everybody. So uh, I'm trying to raise a little bit of money to do that. Uh, if you have a little bit that you can spare and you want to support that record, I'll put the link here. That's the GoFundMe link. You can check it out. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thanks for the great, great questions. Really appreciate it. This was a fun one. Uh, I'll, I'll do another one of these uh, soon, maybe in a week or two. Take good care.